The Fed is all over the place on rate cuts and inflation. Jay Powell keeps flip-flopping his positions, sometimes in a matter of only a couple weeks. Now, for most of the public, this is kind of unsettling. The lack of confident position coming from the nation's top central banker just adds unnecessarily to the anxiety. They know that something isn't right because they can't get any straight answers from the guy. Here, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Just a couple days ago, Powell said, the recent data have clearly not given us greater confidence. It is likely to take longer than expected to achieve that confidence. And that confidence he's talking, of course, about inflation or how he defines inflation. But this is what he said just a few weeks ago in early March. We're waiting to become more confident inflation is moving sustainably at 2%. When we do get that confidence and we're not far from it, it'll be appropriate to begin to dial back the level of restriction. And just to add more emphasis to the flip-flopping, this is what he said last June. He said that rate cuts were a couple of years out. So last year, rate cuts were a couple of years out. Then last December, he admits at the FOMC press conference that they're talking about rate cuts. Then earlier this year, he says they're almost confident. They're nearly there in their confidence about inflation so they can start rate cuts. And then last this week, he says, no, nah, we're not confident at all. And we don't see any path to get confident. Why doesn't Jay Powell seem to have any idea about consumer prices? And why can't we get any solid answers on any of this stuff, inflation or rate cuts and anything else? Well, I have the answer on why we can't and don't get any answers. And my answer starts with the non-answer a guy by the name of William Proxmire got from the Federal Reserve Chairman Arthur Burns back in 1975. So who is William Proxmire? Well, let's start there with a little bit of a background. William Proxmire was senator from Wisconsin and from about 1957 forward, throughout the 60s and 70s. And up until the middle 1970s, he was largely known as the senator who replaced Joe McCarthy after he died. But his real claim to fame came in the middle 1970s when he started giving out the Golden Fleece Award. This was given to government projects that were deemed in his estimation to be wasteful spending, just ridiculous items that we see nowadays from some people like Rand Paul who've carried on the tradition. Now, ironically, just to give you some more background and detail on the guy, the second, the second Golden Fleece Award he gave in 1975 went to a fellow by the name of Ronald Hutchinson, who was a psychologist who was trying to unravel the biological cause of, uh, of aggression. And he had, been, he had been given almost half a million dollars in grants, which was a lot of money back at that in those days, from various government agencies over a pretty significant length of time, studying, for example, why rats, monkeys, and humans clench their jaws. So you can see why Proxmire was going to give the guy, gave the guy a Golden Fleece Award, except that Hutchinson ended up suing Proxmire because he lost grant money in the wake of being given that award. He sued Proxmire for defamation, and in 1979, they actually settled in Hutchinson's favor for $10,000 in addition to Proxmire having to read an apology on the floor of the Senate. But the real irony here for the Golden Fleece Award, the second one he ever gave, was that it cost taxpayers $124,351 to pay for Proxmire's legal defense. Talk about being fleeced. But what that shows and what this whole episode shows is that Proxmire indeed had an interest in fiscal as well as economic matters. And a couple of years before the stuff with the Golden Fleece Award, back in 1973, remember, this is the Great Inflation. And in 1973, it wasn't oil prices. By then, the Great Inflation was already about eight years old. And Proxmire wanted some answers, damn it. He didn't want to just sit there and, and listen to the same political spew over and over again, that it was about wages, that it was about the labor market. Maybe, just maybe, this inflation stuff was monetary. So he sent a letter to then chairman of the Federal Reserve, Arthur Burns. This was September of 1975. This was September of 1973. And among other things, he asked, Mr. Burns, maybe the money supply had increased much too much last year. In fact, that the increase would have been too much even if we had been in the depths of a recession instead of enjoying a fairly vigorous economic expansion. Basically, again, saying, might there be a connection to money supply, the level of money supply, the changes in the money supply, and the rampant inflation that you don't seem to be able to do anything about, nor does anyone in the government seem to have any answers for? 
And Arthur Burns, as was his typical fashion, it took him a couple months to get around to answering Senator Proxmire. And when he did in November 1973, he basically gave away the entire thing without really realizing the profound implications of what he was saying. Coming back to Proxmire, Burns wrote, monetary policy could be improved if steps were taken to increase the precision with which the money supply can be controlled by the Federal Reserve. Part of the present control problem stems from statistical inadequacies, chiefly the paucity of data on deposits at non-member banks. Keep that in mind, we're gonna come back to that. Also, however, control over the money supply and other monetary aggregates is less precise than it can or should be because non-member banks are not subject to the same reserve requirements as our Federal Reserve members. And the crafty politician that Burns was, that's how he lasted through most of the great inflation without, without being thrown out on his butt. The crafty politician that Burns was, he turned this around and said, part of this problem is you, Congress. It's you, Senator Proxmire, because you haven't given the Federal Reserve all the tools it actually needs. Continuing with Burns' letter. I hope that the Congress will support efforts to rectify these deficiencies. For its part, the Federal Reserve Board is even now carrying on discussions with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation about the need for better statistics on the nation's money supply. The board also expects shortly to recommend to Congress legislation that will put demand deposits at commercial banks on a uniform basis from the standpoint of reserve requirements. And commercial banks is the key here. It's everything. And the term back in the 1970s meant something very different than what it means today. Commercial banks today are just basically all banks. There isn't really any distinction. But that all really changed in 2008 and 2009. Before then, they were very different categories. They were depositories, which we think of as banks, those loan-making entities that have vaults, even though the vaults weren't really that important at that time. And then there were these commercial banks, or what we used to call investment banks, those like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and part of J.P. Morgan that was a securities business before it was merged with Chase and became both. It was the cons consolidation in the 1990s that really began to blur the lines between depository banks, which were regulated by the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the Office of Control of the Currency, and these commercial banks. What Burns was getting at, correctly I might add, is that the issue was with commercial banks. We know what's going on with depositories. We, we've got M1, we've got M2. We can see what they're doing, but there's a whole lot else happening with these commercial banks that maybe that's something we should take a closer look at. As Burns noted in his letter back to Proxmire, we have a couple different means of, of measuring money supply. There was M1, which is the, the, the closest to transaction balances. There was M2, which includes a lot of the depository balances and even came up with something like M3, which added savings deposits at mutual savings banks and SNLs. But he also wrote, quote, a definition embracing other liquid assets could also be justified. For example, one that would include large denomination negotiable time certificates of deposit, U.S. savings bonds, and treasury bills in the money supply, commercial paper, and other short-term money market instruments. And of course, there was also things like repo and euro dollar deposits and repo outside offshore. He didn't mention any of the offshore stuff, but that's where a lot of this, a lot of all of this money creation and experimentation, the qualitative expansion of money itself that he was actually talking about was taking place. Commercial banks, non-member commercial banks outside the US. Maybe Burns was saying, that has something to do with the great inflation. Going back to his letter one more time, he said, there are many assets closely related to cash and the public can switch readily among these assets. However money may be defined, the task of determining the amount of money needed to maintain high employment and reasonable stability of the general price level is complicated by shifting preferences of the public for cash and other financial assets. And that part about other financial assets is everything. And it's a very broad category. And I think he was nonspecific for that, that particular purpose. It was the 
proliferation of products that Alan Greenspan talked about in June of 2000. Basically, the commercial bank experimentation and all these various forms of money that the public actually use, not necessarily you and me or regular folks on the street, but by the public, it means commercial agents, businesses, large corporations. They were using repos as checking accounts, essentially outside the monitoring capabilities, outside the definitions, outside the understanding of the Federal Reserve. So Burns actually said, we don't really know what we're doing here because of what banks are up to. Now, William Proxmire took that knowledge and some other knowledge that he gained along the way. And in 1975, when he was at the midst of his Golden Fleece fame, he actually began to sponsor bills to reform the banking system and even the regulators themselves. The regulators he wanted to reform in part because he didn't think he was getting the answers he deserved. He accused them of secrecy, that, that they were withholding information specifically about this very topic in banks. And he was partly right that the Fed was withholding information largely because they, they really didn't want to admit the full truth. And that full truth was they had lost complete control. So when in 1975, December of 75, when Proxmire was sponsoring his reform bills, he actually said that unless the current trend in banking was reversed, quote, our economy would eventually be controlled by a few giant banking institutions. The concentration of banking resources has already proceeded to an alarming level. And to try to rectify that situation, he wanted to merge the FDIC, the OCC, and the Federal Reserve together in one bank regulator, one single entity regulating banks. Not that it would have made any difference because as Burns was pointing out, the real money stuff was happening outside of the traditional banking system. And as we, as we would find out the hard way in the 1980s and 1990s, especially after the SNL crisis, when the depository way of banking really took its final, the final nail, nail in its coffin, commercial banking was already the wave of the future. The commercial banking was the euro dollar system. And by the 1970s, commercial banking was already dominating at the margins. And by the 1990s, it had already taken over, not just the United States system, but the rest of the world. And in doing so, this original problem was never solved. Arthur Burns wanted more power to be able to get more information about what was happening. And in the end, the Federal Reserve, not under Arthur Burns, but under Paul Volcker, would abandon that task. In fact, they would abandon money entirely. You don't have to take my word for it. Here's Alan Greenspan in March of 1991, admitting what the Federal Reserve had been, had been relegated to, what it had actually become in the wake of all this massive monetary evolution during the great inflation 70s. Greenspan said, I must say I'm still quite reluctant to cave in, if you will, on this question that we can do nothing but target the federal funds rate. That's all they can do. This issue arises largely because what we are doing de facto is targeting the funds rate. I'm not sure that any of us believes that that's the right policy, but they had no choice because the processes that began in the 1970s didn't end. They only expanded and proliferated. More financial products, more forms of money that the commercial system was using far outside the Fed's scope. Outside the United States, offshore, commercial banks, commercial banks then dominated. Then came along Graham Leach Bliley, which allowed commercial banks and depositories to start putting themselves together. And it was an entirely unrecognizable system. Think about it. The one thing you never hear Jay Powell or any central banker talk about is money. They never bring it up. They talk about monetary policies, but their monetary policies are about moving interest rates around. Exactly what Greenspan was saying in 1991. Federal Reserve is not a monetary institution. It's an interest rate control mechanism that attempts to influence the behavior of economic agents. Maybe if they're lucky, the behavior of the monetary system, the commercial banking system. What Arthur Burns said in the 1970s wasn't that money wasn't, wasn't important. What he said was, we don't know what it is. We can't figure it out. And unless we can, there's really no hope of instituting an actual monetary policy. 
Volcker, ironically, would come to the same conclusion too, as would Greenspan, which is why he was admitting in 1991, all they do is move the interest rate around and call it monetary policies. Not only does this complicate central bank efforts and central bank mechanics because they're stuck sort of at the end of the process trying to change in short-term interest rates and hope that has some effect on the economy, it also complicates their interpretation. How do they, how do they actually see and understand what's happening in the real economy? They have to wait for a consumer price number to come out after it's already been calculated and tabulated, after it's already happened, to try to pull it apart and see what they can make of what's happening in the consumer price index in order to try to then put together, piece together some comprehensive idea of what might be happening in the real economy. And maybe if they're lucky again, if that might include the monetary system too. It's all backwards. And in a backwards process like this, of course you aren't gonna have any confidence over inflation, the economy, or your non-money monetary policies because you're always at, mer at the mercy of the next CPI. And CPIs are oftentimes influenced by things that have nothing to do with long run money and real inflation, such as oil or the imputations of rents, some of those things. As Steve Van Meter likes to point out, the Federal Reserve is trying to f drive a car with the windshield completely covered and looking in the rear view or maybe the side mirror on occasion. They're always doing it backwards. And here's the thing here, by losing touch with monetary, really monetary conditions and the monetary system itself, what central bankers have done has left us exposed to all the downside that they can never actually see, or in certain circumstances, will never admit to like 2008 and 2009. What was that really about again, subprime mortgages? I don't think so. So our problems aren't inflation. They start with the lost purchasing power and destroyed economic potential of the past four years, which were piled on top of the previous 10. But that's an entirely different story and set of circumstances. And one we could change and get fixed, but only when we start really answering the questions that were asked 50 years ago. Consumer prices these days, it's all about oil and rents. What's the real fundamental behind those two? Well, that's what we talked about in the video link below. As always, thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members and subscribers. Do check out Eurodollar University's spring sales, still ongoing for another day or so. And until next time, take care.